Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I've been looking at the Yamaha YM2149 sound chip, looking to add sound capabilities to the W65C265SXB development board by Western Design Center. I'm starting with the 2419 because it appears to be the simplest of a series of chips that Yamaha created with increasing and varying degrees of sophistication. If this goes well, I perceive making a series of boards that can handle other Yamaha sound chips or sound chips by other manufacturers. Eventually, I would like to be able to support the YM2610, which appears to be the most sophisticated of the sound chips that Yamaha made in the series. It was notably used in the Neo Geo. With the exception of one pin, the YM2419 is identical to the General Instruments AY38910 sound chip. The 8910 had some parallel ports in addition to the sound capabilities. General Instruments also released the 8912 and the 8913, which were basically the same chip with one or two of these parallel ports removed. I don't need the parallel ports for this particular project, but I'm going ahead and using the YM2149 instead of one of these chips with a smaller package because of the capability of that extra pin. The extra pin lets you basically have the clock speed, and in general, you want to run these chips with a clock speed between 1 and 2 megahertz. So that extra pin on the 2419 will basically let us have the clock speed of the 3.6 whatever megahertz clock that's on the SXB development board. Although I've also added the capability to provide your own crystal oscillator on the board if you want to use some custom clock speed that's different than whatever your CPU is using or half of whatever your CPU is using. The original 8910 and its variants were used in things like the Vectrex game console and the MSX computer standard, and the 2419 itself was used in the Atari 1040ST. So here's the data sheet for the YM2149. We basically write bytes to the chip. That's with these eight address lines here. These IOA and IOB lines, these are the parallel ports that we won't be using. And you essentially control it using these BC1, BC2, and BDR pins, although we only actually need two. Cell bar here is not a chip select. Cell bar is what's used to either use the clock input or the clock input divided by two. The chip selects are A8 and A9 bar. So the chip is selected when A8 is high and A9 bar is low. Standard reset. Notice that it can run off of some clock that's different than whatever your main microprocessor is running off of. I think the SID chip for the Commodore 64 works differently than that. I think that's more closely tied to whatever the master clock running both that sound chip and the CPU are. And basically, the CPU controls the chip by writing to a set of registers. On something like the SID chip, you need five address lines in order to select 32 different registers. Here, we really only need one address line because you basically select which register you want to write to, and then you send the data that you want to write to that particular register. So let's see what's going on with this bus control decoder. If we scroll down a little bit more on the data sheet, you'll see a little discussion that says that the bus control is redundant. So there's two control pins and there's a data direction pin. And essentially, one of these is unnecessary. You can just set BC2 high and then use BC1 to control. And if, like I was, you're wondering why even bother with that BC2 pin if you just always set it to high, I think there's some clues on the original AY38910 data sheet. I think that these were set up to make it convenient to interface with the CP1610 microprocessor. This is a 16-bit microprocessor vaguely modeled on the PDP-11 that was used in the Intellivision. So if we take a look at what the various registers do, we see that you can do things like set the frequency of the noise, set the frequency of the three square wave generators, set their level, set their envelopes, and that's kind of fun. 
if we scroll down a little bit here, there's a set of diagrams showing the different envelopes that you can have. Anyway, that's all kinds of fun. So here's my design for a PCB that should stack on top of the W65C265SXB development board. Here we see the connectors that connect the two boards. And if I go back and look at the schematic, we'll see that I have two YM2149s here. I did that so this can match the voice structure of the mocking board for the Apple II. I have a particular emotional attachment to that voice architecture, having spent countless hours playing Ultima 3 and Ultima 4 when I was a teenager. So over here we have the board connections. It's a little bit confusing because there's lots of places to get plus 5 volts, and there's also lots of places to get ground. So for instance, if you want plus 5 volts, you could get it from VDD2 from the J2 connector, or VDDX1 from the J1 connector, or from VDDX50 from the J1 connector. That makes it confusing not to have a distinct plus 5 volt and ground that's used throughout the schematic, but I found I had to do it this way, or Eagle insisted on connecting all of these terminals with air wires when, of course, they're connected on the board that it's being plugged into, so that's confusing. And I also wanted to be able to route power and ground to whatever source was most convenient on the PCB while doing the routing. This does lead to some confusing things. Like over here, I have two different grounds. One is VSS5, one is VSSX49. And I picked one or the other just depending on what made the routing easiest. So the reset signal is coming from the main board. I tied the A8 chip select high, and then my chip select is coming out of this 138. I'll talk about the address decoding in a second. BC2 is tied high, as I discussed before, and we only need one address line, A0 here, to indicate whether we're selecting a register to write to or saying that we have some data that we want to write to the register. The data lines are just tied right to the processor, no problem there. For the select pin here, if you tie this low, then it basically has the clock speed. If you don't tie it to anything, there is an internal pull-up resistor, so it uses whatever the original clock coming in is. So I set this up with some jumpers so that independently for each chip, if you wanted for whatever reason, you would probably use jumpers or not on both of these. You could go to the board and you could either take the jumpers, let's see, where are the jumpers? Ah, here's JP1 and here's JP3. Those are the jumpers for each of the chips here. Actually, let me rename that. Let me name this one JP2 to go to with chip two. Oh, it's not gonna want me to do that. Let me temporarily rename this JPX, and then I'll change this to JP2. So now that the jumpers match the chips, now I'll go back and change this. Nope, not that, not you. There, you. We'll set this to JP3. I could use the various masks over here to make that easier, but it was easier to just randomly click until I got what I wanted. All right, I like that better. Anyway, you could either just solder these together, you know, just put a wire here, or you could maybe put two pin headers here and then use a shunt if you want to experiment without having to solder and desolder things. So I only have three decoupling caps. I probably should have four. I do have one for each of the YM2149 sound chips. Down here, the crystal oscillator, if you do install one, and the HC138 address decoder are actually sharing a bypass capacitor. Maybe I should give each one its own capacitor, but these are close enough together. I thought I could get away with it. And what about that clock? Well, I set this up with a three pin jumper. And what you can do is take that middle pin and jumper it to one of the other connectors. And you can either use the main clock from the CPU board or if you want, you could install a crystal oscillator. And this isn't just the crystal by itself. This is one of those little chunky units that's powered that produces all of the clock stuff that you need. And 
you could use that instead if you want to install one of these, if you want to use a different frequency than whatever your CPU is running at. Again, you always have the option of having the clock speed, which is probably what you'd want to do if you're using the main CPU clock. And you can see that over here. So there's the jumper. Notice I marked where to connect to if you want to use the CPU clock or if you want to use what I called OS1 here, this little active crystal oscillator thingy. I laid out this board by hand and I didn't use the auto router. I like to think about each connection and often that will help me come up with better parts placement. And in particular, I always imagine trying to debug the board later and having to hack on it. So I try to leave spaces between traces to make it easy to cut traces if I have to. I like to be able to follow a trace all the way through without having to repeatedly flip the board over to follow a signal. So the three square wave outputs, oh, I guess you can also have noise. Anyway, the three main sound generators each have their own separate output, but these are typically just summed together. Now the data sheet is a little bit confusing. If you look at this bit about the analog output pins, it will list things like maximum voltage level, peak to peak. But if you look at the way that this chip is always used in schematics, they tend to just tie all of the outputs together. I, in fact, borrowed the output circuitry here from the Mockingboard schematic. So if these are actually voltage outputs, you couldn't tie the outputs together like this because the outputs would fight. So that tells me that I really need to be thinking about these as current outputs, and they're just tying them together and summing the outputs using Kirchhoff's current law. So this resistor here is probably best thought of as a current to voltage converter where you're taking a current, dumping it through this resistor to turn it into a voltage. And then we have these back-to-back -back electrolytics that basically creates a bipolar capacitor that we can then use to block DC offsets and send that to the output here. I was originally going to use RCA jacks for the audio output both to be more period appropriate with connecting to a television and also to make sure that people wouldn't be tempted to try to plug headphones into here thinking it would work. But I ran out of space on the PCB to put two audio jacks, so I'm using a 3.5 millimeter jack. That's also often called an eighth inch jack. I put a little note here saying output needs an amplifier to remind people that plugging headphones in here isn't going to work. You do need an external amplifier. Okay, so now let's talk about the address decoding. I need to select two different chips that I select by hooking to their A9 bar inputs. So the W65C265 microcontroller has a couple of built-in chip selects. We have chip select 0 and chip select 1 mapped to a 5-bit and 6-bit address space respectively. And we already used some of that in chip select zero for the Sega joystick controller mapping. And I was originally planning to use chip select one for both audio and video, but I'm thinking that I actually want to map audio to chip select zero because we don't actually need a whole lot of address pins to address all of these audio chips, even the more sophisticated ones. Whereas one of the video chips that I'm looking at that I might talk about in another video, well, actually it's not really a chip, it's an FPGA thing, requires possibly five address lines. So I'll stick with chip select one for video for now, but we'll move audio over to chip select zero. Now, this particular chip doesn't create an interrupt, but all of the other sound chips that I'm looking at, at least the ones by Yamaha, can generate an interrupt created by some built-in timers. So I'll reserve one of the pins on the connectors for that interrupt signal. Notice that I'm using chip select outputs 4 and 5 on the 138. So that means that I'm picking either device 1 or device 2 based on the A2 line going into pin 1. I'm using that A2 line because we need to use A0 here in order to control whether we're selecting a register or we're indicating that we're sending an actual byte of data. 
And some other chips that I'm looking at actually need a second address line to select a bank of registers. So I'm sort of reserving A1 cosmically for that purpose. In this particular case, I'm setting A1 to the second position in the chip select binary sequence, so that corresponds to a two. And I'm setting A4 to the third position in that binary sequence, which corresponds to a decimal value of four. Now, if we think about what we need in order to get outputs four or five selected, we see that we need to set A1 to zero and A4 to one. So that will give me a four or a five, depending on what A2 is. Now, on top of that, I'm also using A3 into this chip select bar input on the 138. So let's see where all that lands on our memory map. So chip select zero happens at DF00, that's where it starts. And I said we needed to set address line four high, so that would correspond to putting a one in this position. And address lines three and one are both zero, so let's not add anything. And then we use either a zero or a one to indicate rather we're doing a register select or rather we're actually sending data. So we'll say something like data send. So sending data is indicated by putting a one here because we're using a zero to indicate that. And I should say that this is for uh, YM2149 number one, and this one is for YM2149 number two. And I need to squoosh these over, don't I? Squoosh, squoosh. And let's see, oh, actually, no, 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 sorry. This is for number one. And we indicate the second chip using the address two line. And that address two line corresponds to adding four. So I'll add four here, and I'll add four here to get DF15. There's one more input pin I'm using on the 138, and that's this active high chip select pin. All of these chip selects need to be active for the chip to actually do its thing. Now, I'm sending the phi2 clock into this active high chip select. Phi2 is something that is basically indicating whether the address lines have settled and are valid. And that's an important thing if you're actually trying to write to something. So when phi2 is low, the address lines might still be flipping around and are unreliable. So using this here, qualifying the input, as they call it, by phi2, helps us make sure we're actually writing when we mean to be and not writing erroneously. Okay, sorry, we're not done yet. Always double check the data sheet. I got the role of 0 and 1 on address line 0 mixed up. So actually, this is data send, this is data send, and the register select should actually go here and here. So data send, register select, data send, register select. And while we're at it, let me go ahead and update this chart here since we're not using chip select one for sound anymore. Let me get rid of this. All right, 